So today we're going to talk about parators and oscillators, and we'll see that these two are, are uh, related. Uh, comparators are the simplest case, and oscillators are actually my favorite topic of this whole class. So up until this point in the class, you've had circuits that have processed data. You know, signals have come in and you've low pass filtered, high pass filtered, integrated, differentiated, amplified. But you've always started with something and turn it into something related. Here we're going to start with nothing. We're just going to plug in the circuit and it's just going to start putting out a square wave or a triangle wave or a sine wave, depending on how far you get in the lab. And, uh, and that's pretty cool. So some, something from nothing. Well, that's, that's where we're going. So the first we're going to talk about comparators, which is a building block for the oscillators and something we've sort of touched on before. So what is the point of a comparator? The point of a comparator is you have some, you have two analog voltages and you want to know is, is one analog voltage higher or lower than the other one. You want to output a digital signal, uh, you know, a high voltage or a low voltage, you know, one of two states, depending on whether one input is higher or lower than, than the other. And you want to do that as quickly as possible and as reliably as possible. And, and so um, let's talk about, um, well, a, a naive, our first circuit will be a naive op amp comparator. And this is sort of something we've met earlier. And you can imagine us with uh, some, some input, V in. And let's say this goes into a 411 op amp. And I'm going to put it in the minus and the plus. And I'm going to ground the other side. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare my V in to ground. So I, I could connect this, this plus side to anything else, but I'm going to connect it to ground. I'm going to take my output here and I'll go up to plus five here and minus five down here for your power supplies. <clears throat> and let's just ask what what happens here? Well, uh, okay, so I'll draw, I'll draw my, my inputs in, in orange here. Let's imagine we have an input, which is a sine wave. And my output I'll draw in blue. So this is V in and V out, V out in blue. And let's ask what happens to the output here. So since there's no feedback here, the op amp We'll try to make its inputs the same, but but really, since there's no feedback, it's just acting like a uh, uh, differential amplifier, a difference amplifier, just like when we first introduced us, ourselves to op amps. So when when V in is positive, the inverting terminal here, this minus, is going to be higher than plus. So it's going to take that negative difference and amplify it as much as it possibly can. And a negative difference amplified by some enormous amount is going to leave us with a negative voltage that goes as close to minus five as this op amp can get us. For the 411, it'll probably get us within a volt of minus five. So I might say minus five or minus four. It'll get us pretty close uh, to, the, to the lowest it can get. Now, now what happens when the input switches signs? So we're comparing these two inputs. And now suddenly the input goes from being a little bit positive to a little bit negative. Well, when it goes from being a little bit positive to a little bit negative, now the difference is on you know, the correct sign according to this. So, so the plus is higher than the minus. So it's going to amplify that difference by some enormous amount. And the most it can end up outputting is something close to plus five. And so the output's going to want to zoom up here. And it's just going to keep doing this. So this looks like it's working pretty well. Now the problem is the way I've drawn it, I've drawn a pretty slow sine wave. So you can imagine if you put in a much faster sine wave, one of the deficiencies of op amps that we talked about was that they have some slew rate, some maximum rate that their output can change. So when it goes from all the way down here near minus five to all the way up here near plus five, um, that'll actually happen at some maximum rate. So if you try to really make this go much faster, um, you'll see that the square wave is not going to look so square anymore. It's going to be have, uh, a 
slope that goes up, and then here the op amp's going to try to amplify its inputs and go down as fast as it can and go up as fast as it can. So there'll be there'll be some uh, some slew here that happens that takes some time. And, and this is a disadvantage of this using an op amp as a comparator. So typically we don't use op amps themselves as comparators because the output has this this slow slew response. And op amps are purposely slowed down this way so that they don't oscillate. And we'll see an example of oscillation in, in a minute. And you'll see why when you use op amp as an op amp, you don't want it to do this crazy thing. Uh, this is sort of on, on purpose, the op amps are slowed down to have some finite slew rate. So, so let's talk about an alternative, which is, uh, so, well, let me just write problem number one. Problem number one is um, slow, slow slew, right? Okay. So the fix to problem number one is to not, not to use an op amp, but to use a chip that is specifically designed as a comparator. So let's redraw it. And all, all I'm going to change is the number of the chip, at least at first. So here's a minus and here's a plus instead of a 411. But we're going to use what's called a 311. And the outputs or the input's still going to come here, V in. And we're still going to ground this positive side here. Now the 311 works a little bit differently. Its output isn't uh, doesn't have what's called a push-pull stage that, that uh, uh, turn off the fan. doesn't have a push-pull stage that can make the, the output go all the way to the top or the bottom. Instead, on the output of this thing, and, and usually this is drawn quite explicitly, there's uh, NPN transistor that we know and love that has its emitter exposed. So here, this is the triangle here has its emitter exposed, it comes out. And its collector usually comes out as the output. And of course, you still have to power it. So there's still a minus 5 volts here. And usually, we connect this one also to the, the lowest supply, minus 5 volts. And you still have to give it a plus 5 volts. Um, now, this is just a bare transistor here at the output. Its base is controlled by, by the difference amplifier. But if we want to use this transistor as a switch, we need something else. So remember, a, a transistor here, um, the, one way to think about it is that the, the base controls a valve. And this valve, if we're not going to use it as a linear amplifier, if we're just going to want to use it as a switch all the way on, all the way up, you can think of this valve as being completely closed. So no base current comes in. That means no collector current can come in. So it's like it has an infinite resistance because it doesn't allow any current through. Or completely open. So the, uh, the comparator puts as much current as it, can, as it can through this base. And it, that allows as much current to flow down from the collector as possible. And that's, that's how this comparator is going to be used. It's not going to be used in, in the intermediate region. It's just going to be all the way up, off or all the way on. It's going to act like an infinite resistor or a finite resistor. Now, this still doesn't give us a, a voltage signal. So at some point, we need to connect, um, connect this up let's, to uh, plus 5 with the resistor. Let's, let's say this is a 5K resistor for definiteness here. And this is V out. And I'll say how this works in a second, but basically when this transistor is on, um, it allows, it, it, it is a really tiny resistor. It acts like a really tiny resistor. And so there's a strong connection from this output to ground, or not, not to ground, to, uh, to minus 5 volts. Um, and when this transistor is off, it's, it's like it's an infinite resistance. It's like it's not there. And there's a connection from the output up to 5 volts. So the output again is going to go between roughly zero, roughly minus five and, and five volts. Here. So let me draw that. So we have our our input here. Um, but let me zoom way in because I'm going to I'm going to draw what happens. Um, so ideally, this this would happen, right? This you'd get a nice square wave here, and now because you have a transistor with, that's not artificially slowed down, like in the 411, we have nice transitions between minus 5 and plus 5. 
let's zoom way in to one of these transitions. So let's zoom into the transition where the input is just a little bit below ground and it goes a little bit to above ground. But I'm gonna draw that in more realistic terms where there's some noise here, where the input is, is making a transition. And, and this will reveal the problem with this circuit because it's actually too good at being a comparator. So let's talk about these two cases here. When the input is really low and the noise hasn't crossed the threshold yet, um, this, uh, this transistor is gonna turn on. It's gonna act like a very low resistance connecting the output to ground. So that's fine, that's what's happening over here. As soon as this noise crosses the threshold for the first time, this transistor is gonna turn on. Uh, sorry, it's gonna turn off. So it's gonna uh, open up the switch and act like it's not there. And this output's gonna be connected up to five volts through this 5K. So right here where it first crosses the threshold, you're gonna see this output jump all the way up to plus five volts. And then as soon as it crosses again, it's gonna jump down and back up, down, up. And finally, the last time it crosses the threshold, it's just gonna stay up. And until, well, we don't know what happens here. I haven't drawn the input. It'll stay up for a while. Now, this really wasn't a problem with the op amp because even if this was a little bit noisy here, as it crossed the threshold, the output still was, was slowly coming down. So a little bit of noise here doesn't, doesn't affect the output. And that, that's why op amps are purposely slowed down. So you don't get this crazy, crazy back and forth uh, stuff going on. But, um, but the comparator doesn't have any of this. And so, so you get this, this really noisy output and this is bad. So, so problem number two, uh, I'm writing the same color here. Problem number two, number two, is that close calls or noise or slow transitions, these are all kind of related, all cause this, this, uh, this fast, oscillations here. And in real life, you're not going to see this nice sort of square wave shape. You know, it's going to, it's going to go as fast as it can, but the noise changes so quickly that you're not going to go all the way up, all the way down, all the way up. You're going to get some random, really spiky junk that's going to be hard to even see when you zoom in on this transition region. And so this is bad if you're doing a digital circuit, because say you want to count count the number of times that um, the, uh, the sine wave crosses zero. Right here, you know, it, it's a real sine wave. We wanna count this as one crossing. Because there's noise, you know, in, in reality, if you were being honest about it, it might cross zero a bunch of times. Um, and so, but you don't wanna count those bunch of times. You just wanna count the, you wanna count this as one crossing. And so you don't want a digital output that's that's doing this crazy oscillation. So, so this, is, this is a bit of a problem. Uh, and so we're gonna fix this using feedback, or we're gonna use positive feedback. And, and the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna introduce something called hysteresis into the circuit. So let me erase this and erase this. And I'll talk about how to, how to fix this. So let me, Try using this cloth here. Yeah. I have to clean my other eraser. All right. So, any questions so far about the the two circuits we've drawn so far? The op amp as a comparator, which is a little too slow, and just the straight 311, which is almost too good, a little too fast. Now we're gonna we're gonna compensate and the and the the um, the trade-off is we still want really sharp transitions, but we only want one sharp transition. So let me draw the circuit that achieves this and then we'll talk about it a little bit, uh, how, how it does it and, and how to set some parameters here. So we're still gonna have a V in. 
and we're going to connect the minus. Um, still going to be a 311. So there's still going to be this transistor here whose base is connected to the guts of the, the circuit. There's an emitter and a collector. I need to draw the triangle big enough to encompass everything. All right, so, all right, so that's usually drawn. So that's coming out like that. Um, we're still going to connect this up to plus five, and we're still going to connect this up to plus five through a 5K. So that, that part of the circuit remains the same. Um, but let's, let's ask what, in detail what happens here. So V out is either going to be, um, oh, and then let me draw two more things. So it's going to be minus five volts. And we'll also connect this minus five volts. So, so far V out is still going to go between a strong connection to minus five when the switch turns on and uh, slightly weaker connection, but still a connection through this 5K resistor up to plus five volts when the transistor is off. So, so far that hasn't changed. What we are going to change is we're going to change what we're comparing to. So before we were always comparing to exactly zero volts and any noise would bounce around here and cause, cause transitions. So what we really want to do is we want to move the goalpost slightly every time we cross that threshold. I'll show you how to do that in a second. So, so let's, let's build a divider that divides this V out, which, which is really going to be plus or minus five volts. Let's divide that by 50. So, uh, so we're going to have a divider here. And we're going to divide that by 50. And so let's make this 10K. And we want to divide by 50. So that a total has to be 500K. So this will be, oops, 4, 490K. Divide this V out by 50. And these resistors are much bigger for this series resistance here is 500K is much bigger than this 5K. So when, when the transistor is off, you basically have five volts going through this 5K, which almost doesn't count compared to this 500K down here. So the V out is gonna still basically be plus five volts when the transistor's off. And it's still gonna be minus five volts when the transistor turns on and pulls this down to the minus five. You know, in reality, it's probably closer to 4, 4.8 and minus 4.8, but that's close enough. Um, so let's, oh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to connect this divided voltage up to the input. And let me call this V, v threshold, VTH. And this is going to go between, well, if it's this divided by 50, this is going to go between plus and minus 0 0.01 or 1 volts. So that's, that's what the threshold is going to do. And remember, we're comparing the input to the threshold. And the circuit here uh, is called a Schmidt trigger. And it uses feedback in the sense that when the output changes here, it's actually going to change what we're comparing to. So let, let me draw the same the same kind of input again. I'm going to draw a sine wave input. So here's our my little my little sine wave here. And let's talk about the output and the threshold. So now we have a couple a couple things to worry about all at once. So so when when the input is sufficiently high. So say V in is higher than either of these threshold values. Then again, we have uh, a big signal entering the minus and a small signal entering the plus. And so this plus minus minus is going to be uh, a negative number and that's going to get amplified by quite a bit. And the uh, transistor is going to turn on and we have a strong, strong connection to minus, minus five. So is not exactly to scale, but let's just say that this is minus five down here. Uh, let's make sure you can see that. 
on the screen. And the answer is barely, I'm going to draw it a little bit higher. Okay, there you can probably see that. All right, so what is the threshold? Well, the threshold is always the output divided by 50. So I'm going to draw a threshold as being right here. So that's the output divided by 50. Now what happens as soon as the output crosses this threshold, so this threshold is sitting here at minus a tenth of a volt, and as soon as the in, as soon as the input crosses the threshold, now the input is suddenly more negative than the threshold. It's going to amplify that that difference a huge amount, and the output is going to shoot up as being close to plus five. So what's going to happen to the threshold? Well, the threshold is also going to shoot up. It's going to follow it. The threshold is going to be a little bit positive. And this cycle is going to repeat itself over and over again. So it's going to go until it crosses the threshold. As soon as it crosses the threshold, the threshold changes. And this is why this is a positive, positive feedback here. Because as soon as you cross the, the goalpost, the goalpost changes to something new. So remember the logic is that the, the orange input causes the blue output and then the red uh, red is a divided version of the blue. The pink the divided version of the blue. So let me, let me label these things. This is V out. V out, this is V, v threshold. And uh, this is V in. And so you can imagine if this, if we zoom in here to a transition like this, um, if a noisy thing crosses the threshold, uh, in this case, let me just let me just draw over this. I'm going to erase erase the blue. Let me redraw my noisy input here. Noisy input. Noisy input. Now the threshold here is sitting maybe a few volts above above zero, and the second it crosses the threshold for the first time, the circuit's going to transition. So, uh, oops. So it's not negative, so it should be positive. Oops, I think I screwed that up last time. As soon as it crosses the threshold the first time, the circuit's going to transition. But the threshold is going to jump right over the noise to be negative. So that as long as you divide by the right amount, so that your jumping jump in threshold is bigger than your noise. You'll, you'll wait until the noise just touches your high threshold and the threshold's going to jump down here and hopefully it'll jump past all of that noise and it'll, it won't make more than one transition. So, so we fixed the, the problem with, with the, the previous circuit here where it was, it was too good. It was, it was making too many transitions. But we've kept the, the property that the transitions happen really sharply. Right, as, as soon as it crosses the threshold, boom, the output changes as fast as it can. There's no, there's no slow delay. It is a really good digital output, but it's a digital output uh, where the comparator is slightly changing its goalposts. And so the goal is to make this difference in the two, the two uh, thresholds as small as possible while keeping it bigger than the noise. So you're still basically comparing to zero, but zero plus and minus a little margin that has to do with how noisy your circuit is. And you, and you can't avoid noise in your circuit because it's going to pick up noise from the electrical outlet. It's going to pick up noise from, uh, from other parts of the circuit. It's going to pick up radio transmissions at some level. Um, ultimately, if you shield all that stuff and you get perfect power supplies and put it in a metal box, um, it's still going to have thermal noise. And it's still going to have noise from the fact that current is actually discrete little electrons flowing. So there's no way you could ever completely avoid thermal noise or uh, what's called shot noise from, from individual electron flow. So there's always going to be some level of noise that you have to deal with. So you might as well 
uh, make your circuit work correctly. And, and these digital transitions can happen as, as fast as they need to. And, and now you can actually count how many times your sine wave passes what is nominally a, a zero volt threshold. And I've sort of drawn it exa more exaggerated here. This doesn't look like a 50 times divider. It looks closer to a five, five times divider. Um, but uh, just because otherwise I'd run out of room. So you'll build both of these. You'll see, you'll build the circuit without the, without the positive feedback here. Uh, and you'll see that it, it oscillates poorly. And you'll build the circuit with the positive feedback and you'll see that it, uh, it behaves correctly. So, uh, all right. So let me just ask, are, are there any questions about this, this process? How, how we fixed this comparator that was too good because it picked up on this noise with a comparator that's, you know, changes the goalposts a little bit, but uh, only makes exactly one transition. This. All right, so now we're going to get to my favorite circuit, which is uh, called a relaxation oscillator. And I'm actually not going to erase much here. So this is very similar to start with. So I'm going to keep a lot of this circuit. I want to make a couple changes. First of all, I'm going to get rid of my output here. Get rid of my output. Oh, I don't know if you just heard baby Clara squealing in delight at her bouncer upstairs, or you can hear the thudding of the bouncer. I'm sure the microphone's picking any of that up. Okay, so um, I'm going to make two changes here. First of all, we don't have an input because the whole point is to have an oscillator that oscillates. So there's going to be uh, some, uh, you know, no no input, and I'll show in a second what we're going to connect this to. And uh, it's not a comparator, so we're not going to compare to ground. So what are we going to compare to? Well, just like this circuit over here, I'm going to have a divider. Here I'm going to choose to make a little bit of a different divider. So it's going to look and look the same, but instead of dividing by 50, uh, let me just divide by 10 to make, make life a little bit easier here. So let's do a 10, 10K and a 90K. So this divides by 10. And I'm going to still connect this up here. Just draw a little bit better here. So maybe I should have just redraw redraw it up from the start. But so far, all I have is exactly this circuit, but with no input. Now the question is, what am I going to do with the input? Well, we want this thing to oscillate. We want it to uh, give give us something from nothing. We want it to chase its tail. Um, so let me show you how to do that. So. To do that, we're going to have the input connected to capacitor and ground, and then a resistor that comes up, and we're going to connect this resistor over here to the output. Get rid of some of this stuff here. Right, so let's make this resistor, uh, I don't know, 100K, and this capacitor, let's make it 10. And nanofarads for some definiteness here. Um, I'm still going to call this V in, just for lack of a better name, because it's uh, I could call it V cap, like the voltage on the capacitor, but it's still it's still the input of of a comparator. So calling it V in is not too crazy. Although you're not going to put a voltage in. Um, this V out here is still going to go between minus five volts and plus five volts. Just like before, because whether this transistor is open or shut, you're either going to have a hard connection down to minus five or a slightly softer connection up to plus five. So it's still going to be plus or minus. 
five volts. And we're still going to have V threshold here. So V threshold, which is the same as V threshold here. Um, here I'm dividing by 10, so this is going to be plus or minus 0.5 volts. Um, and so now, now what happens? How does this how does this circuit work as an oscillator? And this is this is where the magic of a lot of the different pieces of the class all all come into play together. So let me draw. Let me draw. Let's imagine you turn this thing on. What happens? Well, the the voltage on the capacitor is going to be zero because the capacitor doesn't have any charge on it when you first turn it on. And we don't know what the state of this transistor is. It turns out not to matter. Let's just pick, let's just pick something. So um, say this transistor is turned off. So you're just turning it off. You're just powering it up. Transistor's off, so it's like it's not there. And so V out has this connection through this 5K up to plus 5 volts. So V out is pretty close to plus 5. So at T equals 0, let's just say V out is pretty close to plus 5. This is V out. So be v, v in or V cap. Um, and V threshold is always going to be this input divided by 10. So input divided by 10. Let's, I'll draw it there. Okay, so what's going to happen? Well, this input here, or sorry, the output here is going to be 5 volts. And so 5 volts is going to go through this resistor and charge up this capacitor. Now, the uh, the golden rule still applies where there's no current that goes here. This is just sensing, sensing the voltage. So you just have an uncharged capacitor charging up to 5 volts through this resistor. So this thing's going to start charging, start charging, start charging. And if nothing else happened, it would sort of continue to come up an asymptote. Uh, not a very good asymptote. It would continue to come up an asymptote out to, out to close to plus 5 volts. But that's not what's going to happen. What's going to happen is as soon as this input here crosses the threshold, since this is on the minus terminal, it's going to amplify that small difference. And, uh, and now instead of outputting a plus 5, it's going to output a minus 5. So as soon as this thing crosses the threshold, V out is going to zoom down to uh, minus 5 volts there. And continue on. Draw it so you can see it there. Continue on. Um, and so what's going to happen is the the V threshold. You're going to always follow. It's going to be just divided by ten here. So it's, that's going to come down here. And it's up a little bit more room. Can make it symmetric here. So that's. So I didn't have enough room to draw the the blue output further down. Imagine this is further down than it is. So the pink threshold is going to come down. And now, now you have a charged capacitor that's charged up to half a volt, and it's going to start to discharge. And it's going to want to discharge down toward an asymptote that's down here at minus, minus 5 volts. But it's not going to get there because it's going to cross the threshold. And everything's going to switch again. As soon as it crosses the threshold, the output's going to come back up, and the threshold's going to follow it, and the capacitor's going to charge. You know, and it would it would asymptote, but it can't asymptote. So you end up just with a something that looks like a triangle wave coming out. And every time it touches the threshold, threshold switches. And the output uh, goes all the way from all the way up at plus five to all the way down to minus five. So, so we built an oscillator out of nothing. And now the question is, well, how we, we already have the amplitude of the oscillation. The amplitude of the oscillation is set by the power supplies. They give us um, plus and minus five volts for, for V out. And whatever resistor divider we have, which in this case we divide by 10, so the amplitude of the pink is going to be a tenth of the power supply. 
Um, and and the, tri the triangle wave is going to go, uh, it's not quite a triangle wave because it's, it's an exponential charging, but you're not going to let it go very far. So it looks pretty much like a triangle wave. Um, the triangle wave is going to go all the way to the threshold because that's, that's where it changes. But let's calculate what is the frequency or the period of this. And I'm going to erase this over here. I'm done with the Schmidt trigger for now. Let's calculate the period of this uh, because you want to be able to design an oscillator with an arbitrary amplitude. And as long as the amplitude is small, it'll, it'll be a pretty good triangle wave. If the amplitude is a little bit bigger, it might not look super triangly, but it's a pretty good triangle wave if the amplitude is small. You could always build a small amplitude triangle wave oscillator and then amplify it with the with a following stage. Um, but we also want to set the period. Take questions while I'm writing a super dry board. Okay. No question. All right. So, so again, I think this is called a relaxation oscillator. Um, and uh, let's calculate the period here. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to say, we're going to make a little assumption here because we don't want to deal with this exponential charging and discharging. We're going to assume that since we've divided by a, a big amount, we're, we're basically in the linear region here. And we can estimate the current that is going into this capacitor. So that's what we really, what we really need here. So the current that's coming into the capacitor is the same as the current that's going through this resistor. Uh, yes, it eventually comes from here, but uh, let's, let's just call this I. And uh, remember that for a capacitor, Q equals CV. And if you take the derivative of this, I equals C CV dt. Um, for us, the V in question is the voltage across the capacitor. So this is C V in dt. So we're going to ask for the slope of this orange line here, you know, the, the dv dt, the slope of this orange line. That's what we want to calculate. We know our capacitor. Now we want to know i. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to say that i is really close to, um, is really close to 5 volts, which is what this, this output is. Uh, so is five, when we're going up, it's going to be five volts on top of this resistor. And we're going to say that on average, so if we're charging, we're going up in the up direction. On average, V in is a little bit below zero, sometimes a little bit above zero. So on average, uh, V in is, is pretty close to zero. So on average, this current is going to be five minus zero divided by 100K. 5 volts minus 0 volts divided by 100k kilo ohms. And so that, uh, that sets your slope here. So you could solve for your slope. V, v in dt is going to be 5 volts over rc, so the time, this, this r and this c. Um, and that gives you your slope. And, and from the slope, so, so for, for our example, uh, if you plug in the numbers here, this is going to be five, 5 volts per millisecond. So 100K times 10 nanofarads, that is 10 to the 3, those are the numbers here, 10 to the 3 times 10 to the 3, or the K, times 10 to the minus 9. So that gives us 10 to the minus 3. So it's 5 volts per, per millisecond. So that's the slope here. It's going to go up 5 volts every millisecond. Now, remember, we don't actually go up 5 volts. We only go up 1 volt here. 
So if we're going up five volts per millisecond, how long does it take us to go, to go up uh, from to minus 0 0.5 to plus 0 0.5 uh, you know, one volt takes uh, a fifth of a millisecond. All right, so this, this takes a fifth of a millisecond. That takes a fifth of a millisecond. So when you go, go back down, there's another fifth of a millisecond. Um, so our period, T, is going to be two, two fifths of a millisecond here. And so our frequency is just one over T, which is five halves of a kilohertz. So that's, that's our, uh, that's our frequency. Um, okay, so I would say this is kind of the coolest circuit that, that we're going to build for a while because, you know, you get something from nothing. You turn it on and you don't put a signal in, but you get a, you get a uh, triangle wave and a square wave out. And you can tune the frequency of this by tuning the capacitor, if you had a variable capacitor, or by tuning the resistor here. So you can make, make the period longer or shorter by tuning this resistor. And you can tune the amplitude by, by tuning this, uh, this voltage divider here. So uh, yes, you're making something for nothing. All right, questions about that? Let me erase all this out of the relaxation oscillator. What kind of applications does this have? Well, so, you know, you could ask what is inside of your, your function generator? Well, you know, ultimately there are things like this inside of your function generator. So if you, how do you, how do you make a function generator? If you want to make any signals at all that aren't, that aren't, uh, well, if you want to do something that's not just processing other people's signals, if you want to make your own signals, um, this is how a function generator works. Now, there, we'll learn um, toward the end that there are also a lot of digital techniques. So you could compute a waveform and send it to a, uh, a digital to analog converter. And that's probably closer to what your particular function generators actually do. Um, what we'll learn is that one, that is much more complicated. Uh, and two, it is actually quite, quite noisy. So what's nice about this is you can make oscillators that uh, that only end up giving you clean signals at the frequencies you care about. And of course, since there are square waves around, you'll also get their harmonics. Uh, but you can get electrically very quiet signals. Whenever you have digital signals around, like uh, you know, processors, which we'll talk about later, uh, any digital to analog converters, if you really were to examine the waveforms that come out of that, um, they're really noisy because the, the processors themselves are doing all kinds of crazy electrical things and uh, making all kinds of electrical noise. So um, by having an oscillator like this, you, you can have a really clean, uh, electrically simple oscillator that just gives you the frequencies you care about right? and their harmonics. Um, it's also quite, you know, quite simple and low power and uh, yeah, I guess there are some other advantages, but uh, so it's sort of building up your toolkit of how how you would how you would start to construct some of the instruments that we've been been using. You know, what's secretly going inside, going on inside a lot of these instruments. Okay, so the last thing is uh, a, a dedicated chip for this kind of thing. It's called a five 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 timer chip. And by some metrics, this is the most popular semiconductor chip that's ever been produced. So apparently, you know, for 30 years, they've sold over a billion of these chips. And these are in everything from, you know, your, your bike light that blinks to uh, all kinds of other measurement applications. And they're, they're sort of cheap and simple and ubiquitous. And I'll show you what's inside and, and how to hook them up. There's two parts of this. One is what's inside the chip and the other the other part is how to, how to hook, hook up what's inside of the chip to the rest of the circuit. 
So here's the 555 chip. 555 chip. Um, inside of the chip, there's actually two, two comparators. So let's see, plus minus, plus minus. And um, the chip gets power from up here. So, so plus, uh, it's called V plus, but for us, it's going to be five volts. And inside of the chip, there's a resistor, there's a resistor divider that is three 5K resistors here. 5K resistor there, 5K resistor there, and 5K resistor there. And usually you connect that part to ground. And internally, so, so this is just dividing the input here. So at this, at this point here, you get, uh, oh, there's, I say here, here you get one, well, oh, five, five thirds of a volt here. And here you get uh, 10, 10 thirds of a volt there. And internally, these are connected to the plus input here and the minus input here. And the other inputs come out for you to muck with. So these are inputs on the chip. And this one's called uh, threshold, TH, and this one's actually called trigger. TR with a bar over it, trigger. Uh, and uh, what happens inside of here is something that we haven't really discussed, but we will discuss when we talk about digital logic. It's a simple memory element. There's a set and a reset. And the output of this memory element, which, which goes to uh, the output of the chip, which is called out. And the inverse of that, which will go to a resistor here, tied to ground. And this is called D for discharge. All right, I'll talk about what this does in a second. So this is just a, a one bit memory element. So its output is either gonna be high or low. It's gonna be plus five or ground. And it's, it's remembering its output. So if, if, nothing, if nothing happens, it will just continue remembering its output. And set means it will set its output high. So, so if we get a little pulse from this comparator, it will set its output high. And this is always gonna be the opposite of high. So this is gonna be low. And reset is the opposite. If you get a little pulse on reset, it's gonna set its output to be low and this to be high. So um, that's, that's sort of what happens inside. Uh, and let's, let me draw how, how do you use this thing? So I didn't leave myself much room here. So let me just erase it. So, well, there's a whole, there's an infinite number of ways you can use this chip. In fact, you can buy something called the 555 cookbook, which has, you know, it's a whole book of different interesting circuits you can make with this. I'm, I'm just going to make sort of the very simplest circuit, which is just a, you know, a simple oscillator. For that, you actually connect both of these together and connect them to a capacitor that's going to charge and discharge capacitor. Um, and then you connect this up to uh, a resistor divider that goes up to plus five, say. So here you have a resistor and another resistor and let's let's say this is uh, 10k and this is 10k and in the center here you bring this over to the discharge pin and that's it you can ignore the out all right so how does this work well when you first turn this thing on the transistor is off and so no current flows through this discharge so this, this wire might as well just not be there. And the capacitor charges through this, uh, both resistors. So, so you get some charging that happens. So this is zero volts, no charge. Um, so let's see how, how far it goes. Well, it's gonna charge, it's gonna charge, it's gonna charge. And the only thing that can make it do anything different is if this discharge comes on. So let's look at how, 
how this discharge could come on. Well, to turn this discharge on, this transistor needs to be on, which means that Q needs to be high, or sorry, Q bar needs to be high. And since this is always the opposite of this, it means that this needs to be low. This becomes low when reset happens. When does reset happen? Well, reset's gonna make a little pulse here when this input goes above this two, two thirds of the power supply. So maybe I should have said, uh, let, me, let me call this uh, two thirds times five volts. That might make more sense, two thirds times five volts. Okay, so when we're two thirds of the way to the top, then this threshold is gonna be slightly higher and you're getting a little pulse out that's gonna turn the output off and turn this transistor on. And now current can flow back this way. And so we're gonna be, there's our, our one third threshold, there's our two thirds threshold. This is one third of five volts. This is two thirds of five volts. So as soon as you hit two thirds of five volts, this discharge is going to come on and it's going to start to discharge. And when it's discharging and this transistor is on, it acts like a very low resistance. So the capacitor is going to discharge through just one of these 10 kilo ohm resistors through, through here to ground. So the discharging is going to happen at a much faster slope than the charging. But it's only going to go down to a third of the power supply because at that point, um, suddenly this output is gonna be less than the, the third threshold and you're gonna get a little set pulse. The set pulse is gonna turn this on and turn this off. And when this is off, you're gonna stop discharging. And so you're gonna charge and discharge, charge and discharge, charge and discharge. So you can get a, kind of a shark fin wave. And by changing, these resistors here, you can get a sharper or a less sharp wave here. Uh, and in fact, if you make this bottom resistor really tiny, the discharging happens really fast. And so you get more of a sawtooth. You get a slow charge and almost instant discharge through this transistor here. And so by, by playing with the, the two resistors here, uh, you can get all kinds of different shapes. And you'll, you'll play with that a little bit today. And, uh, and you can always use this output just as a as a, uh, a digital output for for a timer. So this is just going to be a square wave that comes from a digital circuit. That's either going to be five volts or minus five volts. Or, sorry, five volts or ground. There's no minus five in the circuit. Um, and and when we get to our very last lab and you sample audio, uh, you could have different clocks for sampling the audio and filtering the audio and doing some other stuff. And you can make them out of this, out of these 555 chips if you want. Um, and then you can have uh, variable resistors here where you turn the variable resistor and you, you can change the, the frequency of the timer. So uh, I would encourage you to, to build and spend a lot of time on the relaxation oscillator, which is you know, my, my favorite circuit. Understand how that works in great detail. Um, if you get to this one, great. Um, you, you may or may not get practice with it again later, if, if, uh, depending on how we sample the audio. Um, and there's another circuit that's, that's in the book, uh, which is a way of generating a sine wave. So none of these circuits so far have generated really clean sine waves. Uh, but there's a really interesting circuit in the book that uses uh, a couple of different feedback mechanisms to pick exactly one frequency and amplify only that frequency and, uh, and sense a, you know, a pure tone, a pure frequency is a sine wave, it'll amplify only one pure sine wave. And, and that's a way of getting a really clean, pure sine wave tone out. Um, but I'll, I'll let you if, you, if you happen to get there, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you play with that. Um, that's kind of cool because it involves a light bulb. Part of the feedback involves a, heating up and cooling down a light bulb. So a light bulb will heat up until it reaches some certain threshold and then it will, uh, it will stop heating up because it reaches some, some perfect balance condition where, uh, uh, where if it heated up anymore, this, this feedback circuit tells it to cool down a little bit. Uh, there's, there's many different feedback mechanisms working on that circuit. 